All right. So I'm sticking around, Nick. It's my show today. So on our team, I, I did this presentation to, uh, for our team a couple weeks ago. A lot of the agents on our team do a lot of presentations in front of whether it's large groups of people, medium groups of people, small groups of people, and even intimate mm -hmm. groups of people in their homes. You know, we have some agents that will bring in 10 to 12 couples, do a dinner in their home and do a seminar on, on you know, investing in real estate. And we're seeing a lot more and more agents um, get in front of groups of people. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so this is one of my favorite subjects to, to talk about. So I wanted to, and my wife, as you know, she's, she speaks all over the, the country. And so her and I throughout the years, over many glasses of vino, have just talked about, you know, the ins and the outs, the do's and the don'ts. We're not necessarily... Uh, would consider ourselves the greatest presenters in the world or have all the knowledge in the world. But we've learned some things over the year, so we thought we would, um, I thought I would just do this presentation today. Plus, we couldn't get anyone else to come on today. So, so you're not supposed to say that. Uh -oh. <laughs> I would say that, that learning from someone who's doing is always the best option. I know Mike and Mindy both personally are doing presentations pretty consistently. So this is a pretty awesome uh, I think guest speaker spot for you to kind of fill because people are going to learn from someone who's actually doing it every single week. All right. Appreciate it, Nick. You're awesome. Thanks, I won't buddy. make fun of you the rest of the day. I don't believe you. Okay. The rest of the, the rest of the podcast. Still don't believe you. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so when you are putting together a presentation and for, and this could, I mean, I'm not going to lie. This could even be a listing presentation or a buyer presentation. But when you're in a group of people, uh, you always have to be in that mode, I am closing. You're always closing. For me, when I take a look at a 20-minute presentation, I take a look at a 30-minute presentation, I take a, a look at a listing presentation. The closing is the most important part of any strategy. How are you going to close this out? What is going to be my call to action? I know before I get in front of a group of agents, whether I'm presenting to agents or a group of investors, I know what that call to action is going to be. What is it? What exactly is the one thing that when I'm done, I'm going to want them to do? Uh, and if it's a listing presentation, obviously at the very end of that presentation, I know all things leading up to it is to get them to sign the ER. Now, with, with uh, buyers, if I'm doing a buyer presentation, I know that call to action at the very end, I'm wanting them to sign the buyer broker agreement. If I'm doing a, uh, you know, a, a group of people, what is that call to action at the end of it? Is there going to be a link to an online form? Is there going to be a link to my calendar? Uh, what, what is that call to action going to be? Everything else that you say and present, whether it's your PowerPoint slides, whether it's handouts, whatever the content is, everything leads to the moment of the close. And sometimes we get to the close and we're like, okay, that's where we fumble the football. Mm -hmm. And the close is the most important part of the entire presentation. I think some of the heartburn over the close is it's been built up to be this huge, huge thing. Um, you're being intentional. That's what you're doing. You're setting up a conversation so that the people at the end of it do the thing that you're intending them to do. You're being intentional. I see a lot of agents that do Facebook posts, build flyers, do any kind of marketing. There's no close. There's no call to action. There's no intentionality. Why are you posting? What is the reason for that post? Is it just to say that you helped some buyers sell a home? Okay, cool. But if you're going to take the time to do anything in your business, marketing, presentation-wise, you should be having – you should have some intention behind it. You should have a call to action. You should have a specific close in mind on everything that you're doing, not just when you're standing in front of a group of individuals. So I think that point rings home for everything that you're doing. Take a huge step back and think about the last couple of posts, the last couple of uh, engagements you've done marketing wise, whether it be social media or in public, what is the intention of that? And what was the close? What was the goal, the call to action? There should be that on every yeah. single thing that you put out there. Yeah. And going back to the strategized call to action, if I have a group of 30 people 
and they've indulged me for 30 minutes. And I get to the very end, and I run out of time, and I'm like, all right, uh, my business cards are on the on yeah. the table. Uh, go ahead and just give me a call if you're interested. You have literally just wasted mm-hmm. not only 30 minutes of the presentation time, but you've wasted all that time preparing. And for those of you listening that have, have attended any of my classes or any of my workshops, you know, and if you can think back, you know at the very end we have a very specific call to action. Do this. And it's very, very intentional. And so when we start and I start putting together a class and start putting together a presentation, I know what that call to action yeah, you is. You start going with the end be. in mind. Start, yeah. yeah, and reverse and, engineer. And if you're not thinking about putting yourself in that situation, if you're not putting yourself in the room listening to you speak, you're doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. All right, so uh, my wife and I, one time years and years and years ago, God, you remember when we were at the uh, the Cave Creek and Bale office mm-hmm. and we were doing those little power lunches? Well, you had a fanny pack on at one point. I have a lot of pictures of that. <laughs> and so, so one of our audience members, he was in the uh, he was actually in the Public Speakers Hall of Fame, and he coaches and he mentors. And I don't I don't even know if he's still alive, but coaches and mentored public speakers from just everywhere and we had the opportunity to sit down for him uh, sit down with him for a couple minutes and he looked at us and he goes you know when you get done with the presentation he goes you know how you've done a good job and I'm like I don't have a clue man that's why I'm talking to you and he goes you've not you know you've done a great job at the end of a presentation is when people come up to you afterwards to learn more to ask questions to want to talk to you mm-hmm. and so when I get done with the presentation and I'm done and I'm standing there and I'm all by myself yeah, it's for the next five minutes. I just I know that I didn't do a great job. So it's just a it's a little barometer for us. Yeah, it's it's definitely an ego kick. Uh, if no one comes up after to have that conversation, this is definitely something that you kind of have to be okay with because it's going to happen a lot. I'm very new to the public speaking world. I'm not the best at it. It's not my favorite thing. Uh, but when you get that one person out of a group that comes up to you to ask you a couple questions, you know that at least you resonated with that one person, and that's a win. And you've got to take that. It is when you're standing there by yourself. And, and only Mike comes over to say hi to you, you know that it might not have been the, <laughs> the best conversation. All right, so now that we've got the uh, closing in mind, now we start from the very beginning. Have a strong opening. First impressions are everything. Mm-hmm. That is why when I am talking to a seller, um, I will literally, on the listing presentation, I will put them in my car, we will drive around the block, and I'll tell them, pretend you're the buyer. We pull up. Take a look at the yard. What do you see? We're going to open up that front door because that's where prospective buyers are going to go first. Open it up on what do you see? First impressions are everything. And if the there are tons of weeds in the yard and they open up the front door and the carpet's messed and there's clutter everywhere, not to saying that they won't buy the house, but it's going to be a hard, it's harder and harder to sell. So you have one shot when you are presenting in front of a group of people. You got one shot at the very beginning to catch their interest. The biggest infraction that I see, especially with new presenters, is making the audience feel nervous for them. When you get up there and make comments like, okay, well, this is my first time. I'm really nervous right now. Da, da, da. You, you make comments like that trying to elicit empathy or sympathy from the audience, it makes them feel nervous and it puts them at ease. You want them listening to you, not feeling sorry for you. And this is something that that I struggle with a lot and had for a long time of being nervous on the the podium, being worried about speaking in front of even a few people. Um, And I don't know if it was you or Marge that told me, because Marge Lindsay helped me a lot through my my career of speaking publicly. You stand up on that stage, you sit in that couch, you look those individuals in the eyes, no matter how many are there, and you just take a pause and you smile. Just a Big, big smile. That must have been Marge. And I don't do a I lot imagine. of smiling. And it calms the room. It gives you that level of confidence that you need, and then you just go. And it kind of helps you not think about what you're about to do because it is scary. No matter how many people are in front of you, you're doing a presentation to earn someone's job, to help them sell a home, to make them your buyer, um, or and to, to pa- pass along information. You need them to click with you, and that, that, that first moment really helps connect. So when you do start... Start and get going. Yeah. 
Um, just start and get going. Avoid lengthy personal introductions. The worst thing you can do, I was in a presentation a couple of months ago, a person gets up there, yada, yada, I'm this and this and this, explaining everything that they are that the audience didn't care about, and then this is my title and this is my lender. I'm already bored mm-hmm. and out of my mind. So if you're funny, have something funny to say from the get-go. Not everybody can be funny. Uh, or have a very strong story that's going to illustrate your point, whether it's a first-time homebuyer story, an investor story, but just start. Mm -hmm. Don't make people nervous and focus on what they would care about. What does the audience care about? That's That's the big one there for your introduction. Know your audience. You can't have the same intro for every single conversation, every single presentation. If you're sitting in front of sellers that are selling a luxury property, that needs to be crafted specifically to that individual in front of you. And Mike's Mike's right. No one cares. You need to get going. Make them laugh. Get them engaged with you on a quick story and then get to the point. And they have just always remember they have short attention spans. And so, yeah. So just so when I start, boom, I just get going and just get started and engaged because, again, first impressions are everything, and I've got a very short window of opportunity to catch people's attention, make them interested in what I'm saying rather than boring them with who I am and, and so forth. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm working on your keyboard. Oh. All right. This is the other thing. Oh, my gosh. When you are presenting in front of a group of people, um, whether it's five people, 10 people, 20 people, you have, to have, you have to ask yourself the question, and this is a strategy. Do you want to field questions during the pr- presentation? Because I see a lot of presenters ha- at the end of every slide. Okay, any questions on this? The moment that you start, and I'm not saying don't, and if you are going to field questions during the presentation, you be, better be very, very good at controlling mm-hmm. the audience because questions can derail your presentation. The last thing that you want is somebody in the office, the office, somebody in, in the audience challenging something that you said. So for me, I like to reserve questions for the end. Uh, and I want to do it after the call to action. After I'm done with the call to action, Correct. after I've, I've closed, then, and I let people, I'll try to let people know at the very beginning, okay, um, we're going to reserve questions for the very end. Or simply have them come up to you afterwards to ask your questions because if you're trying to sell something you're trying to elicit a call to action again you don't want somebody to derail it you don't want somebody to challenge you you don't want somebody in that audience who's right and pointing out something they're right and and you're wrong because you're now going to lose trust um i re um i remember when oh my gosh my early years of doing talk radio and we, when, you, when you're a talk show host, you're like, okay, questions are, uh, you, or callers are everything. You want callers. We even, so bad at the very, very onset, we actually staged callers. And so we were, uh, we were having a meeting with our program director, and we had some callers on, and he said, listen, you guys are up and coming. You guys are trying to get going. You got to ask yourself the question, do you want to take callers? Because you may have that one program director on a different radio station listening to you in a seven-minute segment who could give you your next break, and then you have somebody from Sun City with a terrible question, a you know, boring as heck, and completely ruining that segment, and that can impact your future opportunities. So you have to ask those questions. And in, in the moment that, because you want to, you, you got a time frame, if you continue to open it up to questions and answering questions, you're going to completely lose track of time. Yeah, I think, and this is, again, this is going to be a situation for the demographic you're sitting in front of. If you're sitting in front of a husband and wife that are looking to have you list their home, I think questions are important. If you've got a big group of people in the room, questions are dangerous. You could have you could have patrons, attendees arguing with one another when you open up for questions. The one thing that I would say is set expectation. Whenever you open up for questions, I'm going to take three questions. I'm going to take five, or we're going to open this up for just a few minutes, just so that when you do need to end it, you're able to do that and people aren't getting disappointed. Uh, The one thing with questions, and I did learn this from an individual currently in this room, 
I usually have a person or two ready with a couple of questions if things go sideways Mm -hmm. or if nobody asks the question, I'll set them up because it's that waterfall effect. If you want engagement, if the goal for the conversation is to get people talking back and forth to you, you need to get that first person to break the ice and then it will start to flow. Uh, So it's always a good idea. If it's going to be a big room of people, get a couple people on your side immediately. Absolutely. And and I've seen... I've seen 60-minute presentations turn into 90-minute presentations uh, because, and and I, I don't want I don't want this to be a knock on anyone too, but sometimes you have somebody in the audience that people can't understand exactly what they're saying, and you know, and all of a sudden it's now people are losing interest, and and then we all we all we've all been to real estate school. Well, I take that back. A lot of us, the newer agents, were able to get their real estate classes online, but. Mm-hmm. For those of us that were around in real estate prior to COVID, uh, we were in a room yeah. for 90 hours, and we all knew there was always that, no matter what class, there was always that one person that asked the, they would ask questions that they wouldn't need to ask had they listened to the presentation, and it, and it becomes frustrating for yeah. people. All right. All right. Address the objections up front in our current market um, especially with buyers, there are a lot of objections, whether it's interest rates. Um, I, uh, I talked to this gal the other day, and uh, she's like, yep, yeah. she goes, market's going to crash. I'm waiting. I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? Where did you get that information? But our audience, and back to Nick's point, know your audience. Audience, your, your specific audience mm-hmm. are going to have objections. Mm-hmm. Right now, obviously, market crash and interest rates are some of the biggest objections. So know the objections ahead of time and address them in the beginning. Yep. I might say, I might even start off by saying, hey, we're going to hear to talk about, you know, uh, home ownership. And I know everybody in this room is concerned about interest rates, but I'm here to tell you, and I'm going to show you over the next 30 minutes, why the higher the interest rate, the better it is for you. Now, all of a sudden, they're not sitting there for all 30 minutes going, I'm not interested in this because of interest rates. So uh, always, always address the elephant in the room from the very beginning. This is su- super, super important. And I, I, I'm going to contradict uh, a little bit of the last couple points. The one time that I am going to ask questions up front is when I'm trying to understand who my demographic is. I might not know. I might have a big group of agents or individuals sitting in a room with me, and maybe I'm a guest and I'm not 100% sure who's in the room. So you do ask, by raise of hands, how many people are first-time home buyers? By raise of hands, how many people mm-hmm. have owned a home for more than five years? That allows you to be able to then navigate what the objections are going to be. And as you ask those questions, boom, this is what they're going to be concerned about because you're an expert in that. And if you're not, then you got to navigate around that. But setting the objections up front, getting them out of their brain, because if you don't, all they're going to think about the entire time is this one specific thing, and you're not going to get them to hear the other points of your conversation, yeah. and then you're losing on the close. Yeah, it's a it's a great point. My uh, mentor and coach, Stevie D, he does that when he presents. He's got all these big, giant Post-its on the wall, and he says, all right, and he gets a room full of agents. You know, Mike and Ryan are presenting today. What do you want them to talk about? Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. But he gets those out of the way at the very beginning, and then boom, we can get rock and rolling. Good, good point. All right, focus on clock management. Be respectful of their time. Start and end on time. If you start this presentation showing the audience that you don't respect their time, why are they going to want to work with you? Um, It is not okay to start 10 minutes late. It's not okay to wait for more audience members to get there. It, I don't care if there's two people in the room, start on time. And you know going into it, you've got an end time. The longer, in my opinion, the longer the presentation, the harder it is to keep their their attention. So I try to keep mine as, as short as possible. So no, and going back to the very first slide, Start with the closing in mind. I know how I'm going to close. I know what my closing slides look like. I know what that specific call to action is. I know how much time I need to have an effective close. So I know that going in. If I've got a 45-minute presentation and I'm going to start on time and I need five minutes to close, 
then I know I need to get through my material in 40 minutes. Um, so what happens is when we lose track of time, then all of a sudden we rush the close. Mm-hmm. We spend, spend maybe way too many time, t- too much time on the on the the beginning slides. If the closing is the most important part, don't rush it. But don't be disrespectful of their time going, I ran out of time. Now I've got to extend my presentation by five or ten minutes to do a close. So I always like to have a visible clock. I like to make sure i got a clock in the background. i got a little digital clock that I keep in my backpack that I could put on the podium um, because I don't want to keep looking at my watch. Mm -hmm. Um, So just manage... Focus on clock management. Again, put yourself in that situation. How many of us have been to a presentation to something that we weren't 100% sure we wanted to be there? And when things start on time and they get done on time, you just have that sense of, well, they did respect my time. And that's a really big deal. I think the big one on the bottom there is practice. Uh, You need to be doing this out loud in front of a mirror, in front of a friend, in front of a peer, in front of a spouse. You need to let them give you feedback. And if the person that you're doing this in front of is not going to be honest with you, don't do it in front of them. You need the brutal honesty on this because this is important on what you're doing. Now, again, the situation that you're in is going to is going to navigate some of these things. Having a visible clock if you're sitting at a seller's home or a buyer's home, might be a little bit difficult, but the one thing that you said, Mike, that's super important, if you have an Apple Watch or you have a smartwatch and you're getting text messages and you look down to see what that text <laughs> is, the perception on the other side of the table, no matter what you're doing, is, oh, he's checking his clock. So turn that on DND. Don't be looking at your watch. Don't look away from them. Give them all of your time because that hour, that 45 minutes that you scheduled, that's their time. That's not yours. And the presentation, when you're doing a listing or buyer presentation, those are that's a question presentation. You want time for conversation at the end. So you want to make sure that you've got that built in on how much questions you're going to be asking them to allow them to then have that conversation back to you. All right. Can I vent a little bit? Sure, buddy. All right. So when you as an agent are in a presentation and you're in the audience, whether it's one of my presentations or it's somebody else's presentation, and as long as the presentation is within the time limits when they get up to close, don't pack up your crap and leave. <laughs> that presenter has spent a great deal of time yeah. of putting together the material, focusing on their clothes. And when you start packing up your crap, everybody stares at you and you're walking out. And agents do it during my presentations or RCE classes, and I've seen it everywhere. It's rude. It's rude. Don't do it. Because you wouldn't want somebody doing that to you when you're do- presenting in front of a group of buyers or a group of investors. So that's my little rant. Yeah, I mean, we get things happen, you have to rush out, but I don't think enough people have been put in the situation to public speak. Uh, I think it's an important thing that all of us try to do because it does give you much more empathy for the individual that's up on stage. No matter how good they seem at what they're doing, they notice the distractions. They see the person packing up. They see the person checking their phone. They see the face of the disgruntled individual. So just have that respect for the individual. And I will say this, though. If... The presentation is supposed to end at 11, uh-huh, yep. and it's 11.05, 11.10. Pack up your crap and go, because I'm going to pack up my crap and go, because sure. you're not respecting my time. Yeah. So, you know, it goes both ways. All right. So now the material. So we've talked about the close. We've talked about starting strong. Know your stories. Know, what's wor- know what works. So now the content. Make your content simple to understand. Your job is not to give them all the information. If you give somebody all of the information and all of the strategies, then why are they going to need you? So, and you got to remember, your audience may not understand terms. Don't go up there and go, hey, we're going to do a CRM. I'm going to use RPR. I'm going to do the, I'm gonna, you know, COE. They, they, my buyers don't even know what COE stands for. Correct. So make it simple to understand and avoid the weeds. I see agents, and this is where questions come into mm-hmm. it. You may have one audience member that understands one mm-hmm. aspect of what you're talking. Now you're in the weeds, and you're now boring people, um, and people aren't paying attention because they don't understand what you're talking about. 
So don't make your material, don't make your presentation too long. You want to just give them enough to be dangerous, but realize they need you. My wife, she is a master at this when she presents. She's very good at giving people tools. She's very good at l- giving them that information that they could probably get start get started in whatever they're doing, but she wants them at the end of the day to be slightly overwhelmed and go, okay, I really don't want to do this on my own. Mm-hmm. I am going to hire you. So avoid giving them all the answers. Your job is not to give them the answers and give them all the solutions. You're the solution. Your job is to make them want to work with you and realize that they need you in order to be successful in whatever that aspect of the presentation is. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different things that you can touch on here. It's a very complicated thing that we're discussing, it just specifically to real estate when you're talking to buyers and sellers. If you start to go down every single rabbit hole, you'll be there for hours. And again, that's not the goal. You want to do a high-level presentation, explanation. Someone we talk about a lot when we're talking to agents about doing good presentations is Tony Robbins. Why is he such a successful? successful self-help guru because he when he does his presentations he doesn't give you all of the answers he gives you how to do it but it's an overwhelming concern um, there's a book that I've been reading it's called super communicators it is a fantastic read it's definitely something all of us as real estate agents should be good at communicating those that say I don't like talking to people I'm not really good at communicating you're not going to be successful at real estate we have to be able to communicate with one another and that's the big, the first thing. Make it simple to understand. Mike, you've said it a few times. We do this every single day for hours and hours and hours. We have our vernacular that we use with each other. You can't assume the other person has that information, but you also don't want to be condescending. So you're setting expectation in the beginning of the conversation. You know, I use these terms all the time. I don't want to say anything that you might not understand. So I'm going to explain the process as we go through. Is that okay for you? So you're asking them for permission to make it simple. You're asking them permission to do a high level conversation and they're giving you permission to do that. All right, and so I don't. I actually don't have this in in the presentation. So go ahead and just grab a piece of paper and a pen and write this down. If you're not comfortable with what we're talking about, but realize it's something that you need to get comfortable with, I would. I couldn't recommend joining a Toastmasters yeah. group yeah. any more uh, than I can. Um, it is a great, great group, and where people who are terrified of public speaking, terrified of presenting, and don't know how to present. They join these groups of like-minded people where everybody is there to help each other get through it. I met this lady in Vegas, um, not that kind of lady, uh, and she was a title rep and very, very outgoing. And we were having this discussion on how she used to be terrified. She could not, she couldn't speak to anyone. She couldn't even speak to anybody one-on-one. But the title company said, you're going to be a rock star. And so they sent her to Chicago to do a, uh, a improv course mm-hmm. where she then had to go, go up on stage, and now she's a, <laughs> she's a rock star. That it would be the, the throw someone in the fire, make them climb out thing. But, but Toastmasters is definitely a safe place where you can have this con- do learn these things in a, an environment that's warm and welcoming, and you're not going to feel a lot of pressure. All right, this is, one of my, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes by Plato. Those who tell the stories rule society. So we always talk about on our team, whether you're doing a listing presentation, a buyer presentation, or in a room full of people presenting, storify your pitch. Stories, you have to have stories, anecdotes, um, examples, but make them short. Yes. Don't make it a 10-minute story. Stories relate. If I'm in a group of first-time homebuyers, I'm going to tell stories of how we've helped first-time homebuyers. If I'm in front of Air Force pilots, I'm going to talk about how we've helped Air Force pilots. And name drop if it makes sense, especially during the introduction. Only if it makes sense. Uh, name dropping people you know, that other people don't know doesn't make any sense. If you're going to name drop, you know, my client is so-and-so. And if the rest of the audience goes, hey, man, if that celebrity works with this agent, I, I might want to pay attention. These elements establish credibility. Stories tell your audience that people trust you. 
to to use you to for business, then therefore they should trust you. You can't do an entire presentation and it just be all content. Mm-hmm. You have to sprinkle in stories and anecdotes and examples. Yeah, it's it's again, I, I go back to the book that I'm currently listening to, the super communicators. People are going to hear and learn different ways from the individual that's talking to them. Stories level the playing field. It allows all of us to reflect and kind of put ourselves in that situation as they're talking. And then, again, it depends on the group of people, but stories then ask for engagement. If you're in the the living room of a seller or a buyer and you're paying attention to things around you and you're able to tell a story about something that's that you see, because, again, if you're a new licensee, you might not have the story. You might not mm-hmm. have done this before. So you're looking for any common common ground to then connect with and tell a story about a certain thing. It makes you human, it makes them human, and it builds that connection. And as an example, see what I'm going to do right here? Uh, you know, uh, going back to my wife again, um, I always tell her, because she, she's not going to brag on herself, and she's not going to bore you with her accolades. But I'm like, when you get in front of an audience, I go, you need to tell them that you've trained groups from Facebook and the Weather Channel and some of these other bigger companies. Because I'm going to sit in the audience and go, oh, my gosh, Facebook hired you? Dang. I might. I'm going to pay attention now. It's credibility. Yeah. All right. I tell a story about not knowing what the uh, SPDS was when I first got into real estate, (laughs) and I Googled SPUD real estate because I couldn't figure out what a spud, a potato, had to do with real estate. Well, just go to lunch with me and you'll find out. (laughs) All right, last one. The now the close. All right, we're gonna go back to the close again. Clearly identify what you want them to do. Don't leave it open ended. Don't make it difficult for them to respond. Make the next step as simple as possible. For us, it's all about data collecting. If you have come to my presentation and I don't have your name, number, and email address, then I have lost. So um, for us, you know, I think, you know, in our presentations, that next step, we might put a QR code on the screen. All right. We want you to sign up for this. We want you to do this. We want you to schedule a meeting with us. Whatever the case is, here is the QR code. Um, Here's a link to our calendar. Here's a link to the form. Um, Whatever it is, I know going into it, this is how we're going to end. This is what I want people to specifically do. Don't simply ask them to contact you. (laughs) Uh, Do not. And it it could even be a card, a little survey card on the table. Before you leave, we want you to fill out this card and put it in the basket at the end. But I need you to fill out that card right now before you get up. It doesn't matter what it is. Just know what it is. And create your follow-up system. I've got X amount of people that have signed up for this. So this is now my drip campaign. This is my cadence of how I'm going to follow up with them. Uh, So create your follow-up system. You got them there. Sometimes it's not enough just to get them there. But you got them there. You don't want to waste those opportunities by just letting them leave. And I I can't stress this enough. I know we've talked about it over and over again. This is going to be specific to who you're talking to. What is the demographic in the room? What is the intention you want them to do? Because like Mike said, you, you do this great presentation. You get them to that point. If you don't have a very simple, very clear action item before they walk out of the room, you're going to lose almost everybody that walked out of there. All right. So if you got any questions, there's my information on there. Um, so I was thinking about it. It's 9.58, according to this clock in the studio that doesn't work. It's pretty close. Yeah. We don't ever go over. We respect people's time. That's right. And we've been doing this for 10 years now. Correct. All right. I'll leave you with the quote of the day. The most difficult thing is the decision to act. The rest is merely tenacity. Appreciate everybody joining us today. Go out and sell a home. <laughs>